You're listening to the Global Currency Reset.net podcast. Now, here's Nick with today's headlines. Hello, everyone. This is Nick Gemarino. I'd like to welcome you to the Global Currency Reset.net podcast. My special guest today is Mr. Willem Middlecope. He's the founder of the Commodity Discovery Fund and is a best selling writer. Mr. Willem Middlecope opened a precious metals web shop. AmsterdamGold.com in 2008, and within just three years, the web shop was the market leader in bullion sales in Holland, reaching yearly sales of over 100 million euros. And he later sold AmsterdamGold.com to a publicly listed company in 2011. Willem's best known in the Netherlands for his work as a commentator for RTLZ, a business channel between 2001 and 2008, and he's also appeared on CNBC. Now, in 2007, when most people in the United States were saying to get into the stock market, Mr. Middlecope actually predicted the onset of the credit crisis in his book, As de Dollar Volt, which is translated, If the Dollar Falls. That was back in 2007. His book warned of a possible crash of the global financial system, which by the end of 2008 was virtually a fact. The book is currently in its 17th printing, and over 50,000 copies have been sold. Some of his other books were The Permanent Oil Crisis, Surviving the Credit Crisis, Gold and the Secret of Money, and finally, in 2014, The Big Reset. And in total, he's sold well more than 100,000 copies of his books. And his most recent book, The Big Reset, was released January 15, 2014, here in the United States. And The Big Reset is the first of his books to be in English, and it incorporates some important information from some of the earlier books I mentioned. My website, globalcurrencyreset.net, was started exactly 10 days after his book was released. And after reading his book, I felt it was important to share the information with as many people as possible. So at this time, it is my great pleasure to introduce Mr. Willem Cope from Amsterdam. Thanks for joining us, Wynn. That's a great introduction. Thanks, Nick. My pleasure. Okay, well, to start off with, go ahead and uh, explain the big reset as you talk about in your book. Uh, yeah, uh, as you said in the introduction, I've been uh, writing books about the financial system since 2006, 2007. I've been uh, researching the financial system since 1960, uh, 1996, 1997. Um, and I always had this idea that at one point we could have uh, a major crisis because of the uh, increasing debts worldwide. We could reach a point where the whole uh, house of cards would come tumbling down. And well, when this occurred in 2007, um, I immediately started thinking about next phases and how we could solve this crisis. And it took me some time to understand. Um, how central bankers do react uh, when a crisis like this occurs. And um, I think you have to understand that our financial system is, is, is planned. Uh, this is not a God-given uh, system. It's, it's man-made and it's made by bankers in a way that the bankers, uh, they can make most money by selling debt to the public, selling debt to the government. And um, the system can and has been reset a uh, few times over the years, it has been reset uh, after the First World War, after the Second World War, it has been reset in 1971. And I think a next reset is, uh, is uh, has to occur around 2020 and it can occur as a carefully planned event or it can be the result of a crisis. Um, and uh, if we look at the scenarios, I think authorities, central bankers, always like to plan uh, these kinds of resets in advance. We've seen this um, in 1944 when the Bretton Woods uh, Agreement, which was carefully planned two years in advance. And I expect that uh, the US and the IMF, they both would prefer to stay in the driver's seat and I expect them to propose a transformation um, to a next phase of the worldwide financial center. Um, and there are two major problems which they have to solve. One is there has to be a restructuring of debt, especially uh, sovereign debt at a certain level. And I think we need to find a new anchor for the financial system uh, because the dollar 
has to be replaced by by, well, by something else. Uh, we've seen enough commands by Russia and China that uh, there has to be a new anchor for the financial system. Excellent. And I completely agree with you. And you were speaking about the IMF, and we all know Christine Lagarde recently had that long speech uh, where she was doing the interview and she was talking about the reset. I know you, you, know, you had some comments about that. What do you think about, about her actually talking about the reset it's, so openly? <laughs> it's remarkable that um, she was in Davos and she was giving a speech. And if you look, if you study the video uh, carefully, uh, they're both on your and my website. So my, my blog is the big resetblog.com. And if you carefully watch uh, her, her, her speech, you see that she is looking at a little note beside her on the table. And then she starts to talk about the reset. And uh, she mentions the word reset seven or eight times in 70 seconds. And, um, my my idea is that this was well well planned. She really wanted to, to to use the word reset to introduce it, because if you if you do a search on the word reset or financial system, there are very few mentions before uh, 2013, because uh, nobody was talking about the reset. So suddenly we hear, we hear Christine Lagarde to talk about the reset and. Uh, I think it's um, it, it's an indication that the IMF is working on, on some kind of new phase for the financial system, and it's my idea, and that's that's the point I make in my book, that the IMF um, will try to introduce the special drawing rights, the SDRs, uh, which were created in the 1960s when there was uh, a dollar crisis. Um, uh, these were the years of the London Gold School. These were the years that France was exchanging dollars uh, for physical gold. And during those um, years, at the end of the 60s, the IMF um, uh, constructed the SDRs, the special drawing rights, so they could use them uh, when there would be a major dollar crisis. So the SDRs are ready, but I think the IMF will need a few more years to... Um, to um, advance the system to really use the SDR as a new anchor for the financial system when the world chooses not to use um, dollars any longer. Right, and this new reset is going to be based on asset-backed uh, currencies, and you think gold will be part of that reset as well as the SDR? Well, um, it's not sure yet if it will be uh, gold-backed or commodity-backed or resource-backed, but it's my opinion that um, when you reset a system which um, when you need to reset the system because so much debt was built into the system, it will be quite hard to tell the worldwide public that there's a new um, unbacked currency which we all have to trust. So I think at one point, uh, people will need to understand, and the IMF and uh, uh, the central bankers will, will, will understand themselves that you need some kind of backing for this new currency. And if you study the past, I'm a student of monetary history, and if you study past financial crisis and past currency resets, um, you um, you will learn that um, the start of a new currency most of the time um, um, will give a situation in which the currency was backed by something tangible. Like in the Bretton Woods Agreement. Yeah, it right. started with a gold-backed dollar. And then over time, the dollar lost its gold backing and became a free as currency. So I think... At one point, uh, they will start to um, to they will decide to build a foundation uh, for the SDR, which is real valuable. They could use the gold reserves of the U.S., the gold reserves of Europe, and the gold reserves of China and Russia combined to uh, make a solid foundation under this new uh, um, world currency. Right. And regarding gold, as we were talking about gold uh, in the United States, do you think that we have the gold that we say we have? Because it, Germany had asked for about 674 metric tons, but now we learn that they've only received about five tons of gold. So there, what do you think about that? 
Yeah, well, to start with um, the um, American situation, the gold reserves uh, in Fort Knox, are they still there or have they been sold? Well, no, nobody knows. And actually, it doesn't matter because since the U.S. government doesn't allow any independent audits, nobody can prove the gold's not there. Um, and I think the last independent audit was in the 50s. And since there are no new independent audits, uh, well, the U.S. can always claim it's there and then uh, we have to take it as a matter of fact. And um, there's a lot of confusion about the German uh, Bundesbank uh, reclaiming its gold from the U.S. But you really have to understand very well that the Bundesbank, the German central bank, they don't want their gold back. Um, and uh, it's only because there was so much pressure from the popular press that uh, a few politicians started to act a few years ago and they made the Bundesbank um, to arrange an agreement with the Federal Reserve to bring the German gold back, but not because the Bundesbank wanted it, the German gold back, but because there was so much pressure from the public and from the popular press. Ah, so it was almost like a political uh, thing in a yes. way. Ah. Yes, because the Bundesbank, like the Dutch Central Bank, is part of this US-led dollar system which the central banks have created and support and will support them until the bitter end. And why will they support this US dollar system till the bitter end? Because they know that the West has a lot of power to lose to the East. And when this US dollar based system will collapse, the power will move to um, uh, Russia and China like the gold has been traveling from the West to East. So the Western Central Bankers in Europe, they know they have to back the Federal Reserve in this paper-based uh, dollar system in which gold is the enemy. Absolutely. And we know central bankers don't like, they don't like gold, they don't like to talk about it, they don't like to mention it. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, mm question I have about the IMF now, and this is going back to something you mentioned in your book, and I want to see, do you believe that the IMF is a double counting gold of its member countries, and which countries have the most gold holdings right now? Uh, well, it, it's, it's not a question if I believe that there's double counting. If you uh, read my book, I, I show the proof of the double counting. Um, we know there's a double counting and even a triple counting in the world of official gold reserves, because the gold reserves of uh, sovereign uh, countries like Holland or Ger Germany are also can also be found, some of them, in the IMF gold reserves. Um, and we also see some double counting in the U.S. because the Federal Reserve, um, at the start in 1913, the Federal Reserve took away the monopoly on, uh, on creating dollars from the U.S. government, but they also took away um, the U.S. Uh, official gold reserves, but in 1933, um, the uh, Fed, um, um, in 1933, during the crisis, the U.S. Treasury uh, made the Federal Reserve to give back the, their gold holdings. So the gold holdings of the Federal Reserve were transferred to uh, the uh, U.S. Treasury, and the Federal Reserve received gold certificates right. uh, in return. So if we look at the balance sheet of the Treasury and the Federal Reserve, we can find gold holdings uh, valued at $11 billion, uh, on both of the balance sheets. But on the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve, we only find the gold certificates, while we, we can find the uh, physical gold reserves on the balance sheet of the of the U.S. Treasury. So this is a double counting, which is which is a fact. It's not my opinion; it's just a fact. And um, um, it, to come back uh, to your question, which countries have the the largest gold reserves? Well, of course, we have the U.S. If we have to believe that with over eight thousand tons, then we have Germany, around three thousand four hundred tons. Uh, international uh, uh, the IMF, the IMF has 2,800 tons. Well, this is double counting, as I explained before. And then we have Italy with 
2,400 tons, and then France um, with also 2,400 tons. So if we add all the gold reserves of the European countries, we have some 9,000 tons, the US has some 8,000 tons, and then China is building some five, 6,000 tons of gold reserves. So if, if we all um, put these gold reserves together to, to, uh, to make this IMF foundation for the, for the SDR, um, we have a lot of gold to back this SDR. And I think that's, that's, that's the major plan, uh, which in the world. Absolutely. Now, how about interest rates? Because interest rates in the United States are at an really at like an all time low. And I know in some countries, um, they're, they're actually doing negative interest rates. So what do you think will happen with the United States? Do you think interest rates are going to rise anytime soon? Or could we actually see that negative interest rates like we've seen uh, in some other countries? Um, I think we won't have uh, any major rise of interest rates uh, before 2015. And when they do occur in the U.S. in 2015, it will only be a very small and limited rise because our current financial system with too much debt can't handle normal interest rate anymore. Um, you can um, compare the situation, um, the current situation in the U.S. and Europe with the situation in Japan, Japan has a situation in which the buildup of debts occurred in the 80s during the boom of the real estate market and the financial market in the 80s. And Japan has a, their own financial crisis since 1991, 1992. And um, interest rates stayed near zero for a very long time uh, in Japan. And you see even uh, last two years, you see uh, a growing use of QE because they can't grow themselves out of this, this debt mess. And I think the Japanese situation is an example in which um, is an example for the US and the EU. We'll keep um, central bankers will uh, maintain a situation in which interest rates are very low, near zero. And any rise in interest rate will always, always be very, very limited. Yes, you brought up something very interesting that I didn't even think about, about Japan doing their version of quantitative easing for many years now. And another thing is their debt to GDP ratio is also quite high. It's not as high as the United It's actually a lot higher than the United States, isn't it? 50%. The debt to GDP ratio in Japan is now 250%, 250 um, and um, in the EU and uh, the US, we now reach 100%. Uh, so uh, one of the examples in my book, why we need a global monetary reset, is that the fact maybe we can continue for some years in the US and the EU with uh, the growing and growing uh, mountain of sovereign debts. But in, in, in Japan... Uh, we might hit the wall quite soon. So uh, I think the IMF is very concerned about the current fiscal situation uh, in Japan. And uh, something needs to be done. And a very uh, nice study was published by the IMF on Christmas Eve. So it won't get too much press attention. But this study by the economist Rogov and Reinhardt make it very clear that the sovereign debts are simply... Um, uh, that the rise of sovereign debt have led to a situation where debt restructuring, restructuring uh, is the only solution available, and these debt restructuring, um, debt restructurings, they um, we've seen them before. They've been uh, very popular at the end of the Second World War, and actually, um, uh, Rogoff and Reinhardt. Uh, they prove in their study that you always have major debt restructurings after financial crisis like the ones we've seen in 2008. Yes, and when you speak of uh, sovereign debt restructuring, is that the same as uh, financial reforms uh, that Christine Lagarde had mentioned? Because she had mentioned different kinds of uh, yeah. reforms. Is this the same thing? Well, if you speak about financial reforms, they can come in many ways like financial repression can come in many ways. But restructuring of debt is one of the most important and uh, um, draconian measures you can take to work on uh, financial resets. Because by 
um, restructuring debt by writing off debt, you can clean up a balance sheet. And for example, the Federal Reserve owns over two trillion of U.S. Treasuries. Well, the Federal Reserve can choose to just take uh, this position of two trillion of the balance sheet, and when the U.S. Treasury and the Federal Reserve agree on this debt restructuring, the Federal Reserve balance sheet shrinks from four trillion to two trillion. And if we, um, if the Federal Reserve and the Treasury would um, choose to revaluate gold. Uh, that would make it very interesting because then another two trillion uh, of good money can appear on the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve and the Treasury because the 8,000 tons of official gold holdings in the US is still valued at $42 an ounce. Where the uh, European Central Bank values their gold holdings at market prices, the US still values it at the cost price of $42 an ounce. So when you revalue gold to $4,200 an ounce, the $11 billion currently on the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve and the Treasury grows towards $1.1 trillion. And if you re would revalue gold to $8,400 an ounce, um, the value of the gold holdings on both balance sheets in the U.S. would grow towards $2.4 trillion. So by just um, by these two simple bookkeeping uh, arrangements, uh, the Federal Reserve can uh, can brighten up the, the balance sheets uh, of, of, of its bank in, in a wonderful way. Right. I mean, the money was created out of thin air, and it's just a bookkeeping yeah. entry, basically. Yeah. So, so they... you can get rid of, of the money uh, easily. Absolutely. So how about the euro now with this reset? Uh, could could the euro be devalued? Um, I think all currencies are being devalued since 2000. Uh, actually, they lost between 50 and 80 percent of their purchasing power uh, against gold uh, since 2000. The only currency, um, uh, gold is the only currency that can't be printed. So we see a rise in purchasing power of, the, of gold. I've been talking about the world championship of dollar of of, of money debasement uh, since uh, 2006 in in my Dutch column. Um, I always call it in Dutch the WK Geldontwaarding. So the currency debasement, the world championship, in the currency debasement, uh, and the finals of this world championship they will be played during the coming monetary and financial resets. And uh, I think it's important to understand that. Uh, central banks at some point they would love to revalue gold against currencies because it helps them uh, during the reset in a way I just explained. Right. Now speaking of currencies, do you recommend investing in any particular paper currencies? Um, well, not over 10 to 25 percent of, um, of your net uh, value and personally I prefer precious metals to currency and I think if you buy physical gold and silver, uh, it you could see gold and silver as a currency. It's just another way to, um, it's another, another cash position for me. You know, gold and silver, you can uh, change it into a normal currency or fiat currency every day. Right. Um, and especially silver, I, I love for this um, reason and because I expect that some real uh, physical silver shortages will occur in the next few years. But if you really want to invest in, uh, paper currencies other than the dollar, I think the Norwegian krona would be a nice idea. Norway is a very rich oil producer and it has huge financial reserves and uh, it has a quite limited, uh, uh, there are only a few million people live in Norway. So that, that's one of the safest bets, I think, in currencies. Very interesting. Yes. Um, and for... Other investments, like do you recommend other investments such as tangibles, real estate, assets? Uh, what would you prefer for other kinds well, of investment opportunities? It depends a lot if your net value is $50,000 or it's 50, uh, 50 million. And for the rich, and the rich I think are people over 20 million, 
uh, net value. That's what the bankers of Switzerland use. And if you go to the ultra rich, over 50 million um, real assets like uh, land and uh, real estate uh, is one of the very few options besides owning gold. Uh, silver is, is much too it's much too cheap. <laughs> Um, for the real rich people, they, they have to buy gold, they have to buy real estate, they have to buy land. And, um, but only buy real estate when the prices have been coming down and when they're at great locations. Uh, so buy them at corrections, at great uh, real estate, at great locations. And you have seen wonderful re uh, corrections in real estate in, in, in Spain, in the US, and I think then it's very attractive to start to buy real estate again. Now, speaking of gold and silver, do you see uh, gold and silver rising over the next several years? Uh, yeah, I expect uh, gold and silver to go up a lot. Um, um, we've seen a huge uh, rise of the gold price uh, in, in, in recent years. Uh, I would be very surprised uh, if we don't reach $2,000 gold uh, uh, in 2015, uh, I expect uh, three to four thousand dollar gold before 2020. But I'm much more interested in silver myself. I expect 50 to 70 dollars per ounce of silver in 2015, 2016, and maybe even a price of 100 dollar, 100 dollar an ounce or north of 100 dollar uh, before 2020. So I think it's very interesting. And when price go up uh, in the way um, I foresee, it's even more interesting to invest in gold and silver related equities. That's what we do in our fund. Uh, I'm, um, I'm a founder of Commodity Discovery Fund and our holdings are for 75% in gold and silver equities. Excellent. Let's go back to what you were talking about silver, because as we all know, the uh, the gold silver ratio is extremely off. I mean, historically, silver has been at that ratio of about 16 ounces to one ounce of gold, and now we're in the 60s. So when your your outlook of $100 per ounce silver is very realistic at this point, because the silver ratio at some point is going to have to return to that norm. Uh, I agree. I totally agree. I'm a, I'm a big student of silver. Uh, we just did a um, big uh, research project on physical silver here in our own uh, fund. And uh, according to our model, uh, physical silver shortages have to occur before 2016, 2017. And we used to have a huge amount of old silver, a few billion ounces of old silver coins. And uh, they were here for the last uh, 10, 20, 30 years. But in the last um, we could say since the 60s and the 70s, there always has been a shortages of uh, newly produced silver. So demand for physical silver was always larger than the production of all silver mines. And because of this situation for 30 years now, this whole um, mother load of old silver has all been used up now because you should well understand that silver is used for 50, 60 percent in industry as a commodity, and while gold is always um, uh, reused over and over again, a lot of silver gets, you know, gets lost. Right. And, and I think we'll ha we we're at a point that there's a real um, chance we see physical silver shortages in the next few years. Like we can also like we also can expect uh, physical. Uh, shortage in platina, palladium, because we see a similar situation there. But, but these are much smaller markets, and platina and palladium, they are not monetary metals like gold and silver are. Right, and I agree with you. In fact, I've already seen the shortages here in America myself when I went down to the silver shop, and I walked in there and I said, I'd like to buy some silver. And they said, oh, we don't have any. They had no bars, they had no American Eagles, they had one or two Canadian Maple Leafs and a few old 19... Hundreds, uh, Morgan, silver Morgans. Other than that, they were completely out of bars, bullion, everything. And, and we've seen the same situation with the U.S. Mint, of course, that they stopped taking orders, or stopped production. So, um, uh, signs on the wall, signs on the wall. Right. And now, what is what are your thoughts about the London Silver Fix ending on uh, August 14th of this year? Well, 
Yeah, that, that's another sign on the wall. I think when a price fixing system ends after over 100 years, um, one thing is certain, you're witnessing a huge shift in pricing mechanism in the uh, pressure metals market. We see all kinds of signs and this, uh, the, the end of the silver fixing is one of those uh, uh, signs. And it tells me that the pricing mechanism will change from being paper-based like it's now and, um, to more physical-based. And even the Chinese have made remarks along this way uh, uh, as recently as this week. So the Chinese are telling the world that uh, the pricing mechanism should change from being U.S. paper-based to, to more um, real-time physical-based. And uh, the, the Chinese, the Asians, they, they want to have a bigger say in it. Right. And let's face it, China hasn't made an announcement yet, but they will on their official gold holdings, which we know are a lot higher than when they were last reported, which was several years ago. That, uh, yeah, that's that's true. I think it was uh, 2008 that their official gold holdings, they reported that the official uh, gold holdings um, doubled to, towards uh, over 1,000 tons. And since then, they have kept quiet. But we know from all uh, trade figures and all reporting that uh, the Chinese have accumulated um, approximately uh, four or five, six thousand tons of gold for their central bank gold holding. So it's only a matter of time before this will be officially communicated. Right. I mean, they are the largest producer of gold and they keep it in country. They don't ship it out. And they're also the largest uh, importer of gold, I believe. Yeah, and I think it's very important to uh, read all the uh, stories um, done by Coach Janssen of In Gold We Trust. It's a fellow Dutchman. He's done some marvelous uh, research on the Chinese uh, gold market, and he really produced some amazing stories in the last uh, 12 to 18 months, uh, showing that the Chinese, they do have a master plan for gold, showing they have a master plan for and the next phase of the uh, worldwide financial system. And it's not uh, coincidental that one of the six uh, directors uh, of the IMF reporting directly to Christine Lagarde, one of these six is now Chinese. And so the Chinese were closely together with the US, with the IMF, uh, to bring this um, financial system to a new phase. Excellent. Now, for gold, because you'd mentioned it, do you prefer coins, uh, bars, uh, discovery funds, mining shares, ETFs? What, what do you, how do you recommend people get involved with gold? I always tell people that um, you need to have a solemn foundation of some physical uh, gold and silver. So that's uh, 25% of, uh, of, of, on average, I have, um, um, I always tell people to have 25% cash, 25% of physical gold and silver, 25% in, uh, in, in good uh, hard-based equities. So equities in gold, silver mines can be oil or um, gas producers, um, some real companies who have some real assets. And then uh, you can have another 25% in real estate, but only when you can buy uh, cheap real estate or if you have real estate yourself, which has been in the family for some time, uh, you can keep it because then you have a nice diversification uh, in your net wealth. And with this uh, 25, 25, 25, 25 portfolio, um, nobody lost any money when they have chosen to keep their net value divided in this way since since the start of the first crisis. So uh, I, I still stick to this. Right. And at this point, there's been a recent pullback in precious metals. We now see gold and silver trading very close to where they were back in 2010. So how, how long can this pullback in the prices of gold and silver actually last at this point? Oh, it, it's my understanding, uh, it's my guess that we're witnessing the final stage, stages of this uh, huge correction, which has lasted three years. And I think uh, we're also witnessing the very early stages of a huge new bull market, which uh, is uh, is um, occurring, starting as as we speak. Our fund is up 15% this month, over 15% only this month in June. Uh, we're up over 30% for the year, 
Um, so this shows the the, the new uh, stage uh, of this bull market. There's a lot of a lot of demand in your fund. Um, well, we we've been blessed by very limited outflows in the last few years and uh, increasing inflows in the last few years. So um, our fund is around fifteen million five zero million dollars, uh, and we only started in two thousand eight. So. Um, I feel blessed by this, and I'm, I would be really disappointed if we're if our fund is not up 100% uh, from the bottom uh, at, at the end of 2016. So I, I expect big increases. We've seen the first one, and if history is any guide, you could easily have rallies now in gold and silver equities of two, three, four hundred percent. I can see that myself, absolutely. How about quantitative easing? Do you think the United States yeah. will be able to stop quantitative easing safely, or are they just going to continue to taper a little bit each month? Well, they can taper a little bit, which means they buy a little less, but they can't stop. Um, they can't stop uh, by uh, printing more dollars because the uh, countries like Russia and China, they stop buying um, U.S. Treasuries, and actually the Russians, they sold a lot of their treasuries. So as long as these countries are not uh, loading up on U.S. Treasuries, and in fact, they are loading up on physical gold, um, the Fed can't stop printing money. And I look at the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve almost every week, and I just checked it last week. The balance sheet of the Federal Reserve has been growing by over 900 billion in the last 12 months. So, despite all the thoughts of tapering and tapering, I see the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve grow by another trillion in the last 12 months. And this has been going on for some years now. And uh, I think uh, tapering is a lot of uh, uh, fat spin, it's a lot of, uh, um, well, I almost would say, but the only reason they can taper a little bit is because the deficits of the U.S. government are coming down. And that's why they have to print a little less. But since the Russians and Chinese stopped buying U.S. treasuries in large amount, uh, the Federal Reserve has to be uh, the buyer of last resort. Right. And, and if that's the case, like you were saying earlier about interest rates, they can maybe raise interest rates a little. Maybe, what were you thinking, maybe a percentage at most, right? Maximum. Because we have too much debt. I mean, let's face it, we could barely pay for the interest right now. Yeah, I agree. It doesn't look like the U.S. is in really good shape financially right now. Well, just, just uh, look at the graph of the growth of the uh, national debt, and then you can see that... Um, this is a uh, parabolical move, and we, we know from history this, this can't go on like this. Something has to give, and I think there will be, um, without a major reset of the system, uh, the U.S. won't survive as a major um, power in this world. So it's, it's in the interest of the U.S. to take the lead and to introduce a next phase for the monetary system like they have done in 1944 and like uh, they have done in 1971. Um, to take the dollar off the gold back in 1971 wasn't done out of luxury. It was done because it was needed uh, because too much gold was flown out of, out of, the, out of the U.S. So um, the, the U.S. has been at this point before. They know they have to be creative. They have shown in the past they can be real creative. And they are, um, they at some point need to take some new unorthodox steps to save the system. Absolutely. Now, do you feel that the big reset will be a gradual reset or will it be overnight uh, reset like they've, we've seen historically? And how close do you think we are to this reset at this point? Is, is are we still looking at 2020, or what do you see? People always people always make the mistake um, that they think major changes in the system 
will come uh, soon. I've learned um, that uh, the worldwide monetary system should be seen as uh, a super tanker. Uh, you know, if you want to turn a super tanker uh, which carries oil uh, around the world, if you want to turn a super tanker, you have to start to move uh, hours in advance because these uh, these big ships they can't turn on the dime. And the same with our financial system. So I don't think a reset is very close. Um, these adjustments always take longer than you might expect. It could be gradual with a few smaller steps and then maybe a bigger step later. Uh, but don't expect this to happen overnight uh, in 2015. Uh, the IMF, the US and the Chinese, they all need a few more years to prepare the system for these uh, changes. So uh, I think, um, um, I still expect it around 2020, it can be 2018, it can be 2023. So uh, I think we can have a lot of fun along the way, Nick, and we'll have major moves in the system, major currency moves, major moves in uh, precious metals before this all will occur. And the great time is to invest is now, the great time to prepare is now, rather than later. We should be preparing for the reset now. I think there's a wonderful um, uh, period to invest because um, if you study uh, the subject like you and I have both been doing, you know quite well um, what we can expect. And when gold and silver have been coming down that far in the, in the last correction, the gold down 40%, silver down over 60%, it's, it's wonderful that for the Johnny come lately that they still can buy uh, protection, monetary protection by, by buying physical gold and silver at these levels. And I must stress, I used to have a business in physical gold and silver. I sold this business in 2011, like you said in the introduction. So I don't have any, um, I don't make any gains by um, people buying up physical gold and silver, but I do believe it's, it's very important for your financial health and financial security, and you should see gold and silver as an insurance uh, um, uh, which is needed to, uh, to, to take care of your net wealth. Absolutely. And I want to say your title again is called The Big Reset, The War on Gold and the Financial Endgame. And I just wanted you to uh, tell us a little bit about the war on gold really quickly, since we haven't gotten really into the war on gold and the manipulation. To understand the war on gold, uh, well, it, it's very important that you read the whole story. And that's why I wrote the book. I think 50 or 60 pages out of the 200 is, is on the war on gold. But um, the central thesis is that uh, the U.S. once had this gold-backed dollar in 1971. Um, U.S. had to take the dollar off the gold standard, and since then, uh, gold is the natural enemy for for the dollar, for the U.S. and for the U.S. Um, for this U.S.-centered financial system. And this explains also why European countries uh, and um, help uh, the U.S. by um, by being a good soldier in this uh, war on gold. And we really have to understand when, when, um, when gold would be free, uh, gold and silver price would be much higher. And this would really hurt the uh, US dollar, would really hurt the US, this US central system. And uh, people who want to know more about it, um, they can visit the website of GATA, uh, GATA.org. They did great, some great research for over 10 years on the subject or um, read my book. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you again for joining me with this interview. Did you have anything else you'd like to add? Anything we didn't discuss? I think we covered it all, Nick. Excellent. Thank you for give, giving me the opportunity. And uh, what a pleasure. Thank you so much. And how can people get in contact with you? I know you mentioned uh, bigresetblog.com. What are some other websites that uh, we can uh, find you? Well, I'm um, the founder and principal of the Commodity Discovery Fund. If you Google Commodity Discovery Fund, you'll find our website. It's very easy to get in touch through this website and uh, send me an email. Well, thank you so much, Willem, for coming on to the program. Willem Middlecoop, the author of The Big Reset, The War on Gold and the Financial Endgame. Thank you very much. Okay.
Have a nice weekend. Thanks. Bye. 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 Thanks for listening to the Global Currency Reset.net podcast. Visit Global Currency Reset.net today for more breaking news. And don't forget to sign up for the free newsletter delivered right to your inbox.